Welcome to the final session of Gardening Hacks with me, Bonnie Guinness. I'm a landscape architect, and before I studied landscape architecture, I did a degree in horticulture at Reading University, and I've been designing gardens and commercial spaces for around 45 years. This session is divided into three parts. The first one is moving trees and shrubs. The second one is taking cuttings of new box, blight resistant forms of box. And the third one is about growing vegetables with cut flowers in a cutting garden. So this garden looks very strange. It's very much work in progress. But what it's all about is it was just a mass of comfrey and a mass of ivy here. It's a sort of rather overgrown area. And in front of me over there, I've got some large hazel trees. Now I'm going to cut those down. I'm going to coppice them down and let them grow up again. And that will give this area a lot more light. And having removed the ivy and the comfrey, I'm going to turn it into a rose meadow with some topiary, which has just been given to me. And so the whole transformation of this area will add a lot more horticultural interest and it will allow me to grow some lovely shrub roses. Now, many people submitted a question in advance as to what is the best time to move plants. Now, when nurseries actually lift plants for, for planting bare root plants or root ball plants, they usually do it towards the end of November. Because of climate change, it's got later and later each year. But actually, I read some research about 20 years ago from the States that said that one of the best times to move plants is actually between August and September. And that's because you can move them and provided you can put shade netting or you can protect them from the sun if it turns very hot, they will actually get going. Their roots will get down into the soil while the soil is still quite warm. And so they'll be growing away before the winter commences. So when we get the very dry spells the following spring, they'll be already on their own roots pretty much. Much. And I've since I read that, I've been doing that all the time and I find it is really invaluable. Now here, I've got a lovely little root tree, little root bush. Now this, I was left over from a job and I put it in my hoarding border. I have a, a hoarding border where I plant things that I haven't got a space in the garden at that moment or I want to grow them on because they're quite small from plants. And so you can see it came with these netting bags on which a lot of root balls plants do and you actually plant them in the bag but you can see since I've had it the roots have grown nicely through the bag um, and so you might think well it's a sunny day it's September it's going to dry out surely but I take precaution so what I always do is I gently just drop them in the a bowl of uh, a bucket of water. Now often if I'm moving something huge I'll either fill a barrow, I've got a bigger barrow than this full of water and I soak them in that or I've got a massive tank which I also use provided you can lift it into the tank because when you drop it in the water you'll find lots of air bubbles will come out because it will have been quite dry probably in the garden at this time of year. The air bubbles come out the water can really soak it and then I'm going to plant it here. Now what is this? You think, what is this contraption here? But I've got this, this little standard yew tree that was given to me. Now I could have planted it in the ground, um, but it's actually got quite a small stem and I thought it would look a bit dumpy. And I thought I'd rather have the height, I'd rather have it higher. So I've cut off the bottom of the plastic pot. And so the yew will now root into the ground. Now I don't like the look of the plastic pot particularly, so I'm gonna actually just hide it. And you can see I partially planted its mates all the way around the edge and then I'm going to put this one in front. Now so I'll dig my hole, just move the barrow a wee bit, I'll dig my hole and now when you dig a hole, in the olden days when you read gardening books they used to say dig a massive big hole, fill it with lots of rich compost, pop the plant in and backfill with lovely compost and rich soil. But now research has shown that you really don't want to do that because what happens is then the plant's roots stay in that lovely little rich nest of a pocket and they don't go out into the surrounding soil. And that's what you want them to do. So I'm, I've dug it really just that size. Now having done that, I'm now going to fill the hole with water. Now that seems strange, but 
That soil will be quite dry down below and I want the roots to follow the water down. I'm not putting any compost or any fertiliser in it at the moment at all. I won't do that. Now also, if you dig a very deep soil, any soil below about 450 mil, so about that sort of amount, because there's very little air at that depth, it just, the soil becomes anaerobic. It has no oxygen. And then you get toxic gases given off like methane, which actually kill the plants. So they found that's actually detrimental. Now, if you filled the soil pocket with water and after an hour, it didn't drain away, you would know that you had a drainage problem. And one thing that you hate more than anything is to have wet roots in the winter. It's very good to have moisture during the growing season. If you water them, they will grow really fast. They have a reputation for being slow, but if they have water in the growing season, they will really motor on. So on occasions when we have planted yew trees on badly drained soils, we plant them on a slight mound, about 150 millimetres above the surrounding ground. We planted a mass of quite large topiary specimens on one job and they were all planted just proud of the, of the land and that really helped them establish really well. So we've got the hole, it's got water in it which is draining away nicely and then we lift this plant that's been soaked in a bucket of water and we just position it in. Now when you position a plant Obviously, you can face it any way you want. And when you're doing show gardens and things, you make sure that it's faced in the most attractive way. Now here, I've got the side branches spreading out to either side, which is what I want because I'm trying to hide this black plastic pot. I mean, it looks very strange at the moment because you can see the black plastic pot. But in a year, you won't be able to see any sight of it. So, and then I'm just going to tread it in lightly. A lot of people stamp and push and things like that, but I don't want to squeeze the air out of the soil. I want good contact between the roots and the soil, but I don't want to over egg it and make it too compacted. Um, you know, soil is a living element. It's got thousands and millions of microbes in there. Now, because we've actually cut off some of the roots when we lifted it, we all have lost tiny root hairs and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut some of the top. Now, we did have a question here, um, which related to this. And the question was, is it better to cut the top of a plant before you move it or after you move it? Um, and really, um, as long as you do it, it doesn't matter too much when. If I'm moving a rose, which is a large prickly bush, I'll probably cut it right down to maybe a foot or so high because it's actually quite difficult to dig around a rose if you're getting pricked and stuff and caught up on the rose. So I'll do it before. This is quite straightforward. I'm going to cut it back. And always when you're going to cut um, plants, and I want this to form basically a low hedge. It will come just up to here and just go around the edge. It will form a plinth to the pot. And so I will just cut. I want the plant to grow that way. So I'm just going to cut those side ones off just as you would if it was a hedge, um, because you want everywhere you cut will encourage new growth, okay? And what happens when you cut a plant after you've moved it is you, you've moved lots of root hairs, you've broken lots of tiny, tiny root hairs, so it's got less roots than when it was growing in the hoarding border. So therefore, I want it to have less shoots. So you address the root to shoot ratio and you want to have as good a, a, a roots to shoots as you had before. So by removing some of the foliage you are effectively making the, more roots compared to shoots and that helps. Now if we had a heat wave and the sun came pouring down um, I'd probably get some shade netting, some of that green shade netting um, and I would put it over it but before I did that I will water it in and that's important you know we've watered the hole we've soaked the root ball and now we'll, root, we'll water it in and with watering because it's not established so I'll just watch this plant for any sign of stress um, over the next 
two or three weeks until the weather really starts to become more autumnal and I'll make sure that I maybe soak it once a week. I wouldn't do it more than that because I don't want the roots up on the surface. I'll just give it maybe one two gallon can and this is this is a two gallon can. I'll get one two gallon can once a week if, it, if it's hot and dry, um, maybe every two weeks if it's less less dry. So we had some other questions um, on moving plants and one was from Tom and he said I had a lovely rose given to me by my mother and we are moving house. I really don't want to lose this rose. My no mother is no longer with me and I want to keep the rose as memory of her. And I think that's a lovely question. Um, and many people say that roses are really difficult to move. But I dispute that. I remember one rose that there was work done to the house. It was a really lovely climbing rose. The builders came along, dug it up, chucked it into a ditch. And then the owner came back and said, where's my beautiful rose? And so about five months later, it was in the ditch in the field. This was early spring and got the rose and planted it and it grew away. Um, so roses are quite easy to move. It, any plant, when you move it, it does depend hugely on what type of soil you're on. If you go to Boscoop in Holland, where they have all the wonderful trade wholesale nurseries, it's grown on beautiful reclaimed soil. It's beautiful peaty soil, very deep. And so all the roots stay nicely together in a root ball. If those same plants were grown on a very thin, dry, brashy, stony soil, those roots would go all the way through, out, out, down, down, searching for water. And that would be much more difficult to lift. So there is that variable. But generally, roses are easy to move and they do move very well. I mean, when they lift them commercially, when they lift bare root roses, they'll lift them sort of beginning of October and then they'll send them out at the end of October. Um, they will remove the leaves if they haven't already dropped off because they're of no use then. Um, and they will have lifted them with a machine. So you'll have about 150, um, 150 millimetres, sort of six inches of roots. There might be three or four fangs. It's not a tap root. There's sort of three or four fangs and they might go sideways, they might go down or whatever. And there'll be no leaves on the top. The leaves will have been cut right down. And I do think it is worth cutting the top down to about 300 mil, something like that. Um, and I would move one now, definitely, if I was going to move one, because again, you can get them planted and you can get them watered in and they can, their roots can start growing away. Um, and I know people who have used sort of 20 year old rose gardens and they've moved them and they've all done really well. So there are some plants that are difficult to move, but I wouldn't classify rose as one. Daphnes are notorious for being difficult to move, but actually I think if you take care and that hasn't been in the ground for many, many years, I think you'd probably get away with it. You just bear in mind you've removed a whole load of roots when you've dug it up invariably and so therefore you must just give it more water and things to start with. Uh, and when uh, root pruning is quite handy, maybe not with Daphne, but when I bought um, bare root box liners, so you get box plants and you often get little box liners about six inches big with maybe 300 mil of trailing roots. And so it's quite difficult to plant something with 300 mil trailing roots. So I'll just snip off about half and they grow really well. Uh, and that is worth knowing. If you're struggling to lift a shrug and it's shrub and it's got one or two really deep roots, don't bother to dig down to Australia to get those roots, just cut them off. It will make it much easier and it will stimulate the plant to grow new roots. And just to show how you can move plants in hot weather, there was some lovely hydrangea, Arborescence Annabelle, which were planted in a garden. The owners were moving. They'd been in there about two or three years. It was July, very sunny, and I had to get them out before the new people moved in. And um, actually, I dug them out with a nice big root ball. I brought them back here. I watered them in well, and they're absolutely fine. I just watched them. I put some shade netting on when it was really hot. I watered them weekly with a decent amount. Now, if they'd started to wilt, I would have just cut off the flowers because when any plant is in flower, then obviously it can't send its roots out to find more water. It actually stops um, its root growth generally. So you can always do that, remove the flowers, which helps reduce the stress and that helps it on. But in this case, I didn't have to. 
Right, we have another um, question from, that was pre-submitted, and this was from Sally. She said, I've got a lovely beech tree, which I'm very fond of, but it's in the wrong place. Now, we often do that with trees, don't we? We often get them in the wrong place. I'm loath to lose it. Can I move it? It's about 30 years old. Now, interestingly enough, we moved a beech tree, a large beech tree, probably about that age, maybe a wee bit older, for um, a, we did a tree house at Chelsea and we wanted a big tree that we could move in and make the tree house in. Um, now, it was difficult to find one and we couldn't find one from a nursery that had been prepared, but we did find one on the farm next door. And so we employed a tree spade and you can get these big tree spades and they're often mounted with a power takeoff on, on, a, on a machine and they have two big blades that are sort of shaped like a big cone and they just sort of cut around the root ball. And that beech tree, although it had never been prepared, you know, because often on nurseries they root prune them, they undercut them to keep the root system nice and contained. None of that had gone on before, it was just a tree on a farm. And we moved it into Chelsea, so we lifted it in something like November, kept it on the nursery, put it in a big sort of container and put some nice compost around it and wrapped it. And then it, we moved it into Chelsea in May, by which time it was shooting up nicely into leaf. So you do get many instances um, now of people moving really large trees and you can do that. Obviously you need access to these machines. Um, if, if it was smaller plant than that, so if it was something like, um, I don't know, a, a five or ten year old plant that you wanted to move and you didn't think you could do it in one year, you can always just cut round half the root ball with a spade one year, in, in, I would probably do it now and backfill it with soil. And then the next year at the same time you can cut round the other half, backfill it with soil, um, water them a bit extra. And then the year you want to move it, you come and dig underneath it and you lift it. And that obviously lessens the impact. You're only disturbing half the tree roots at a time. Um, well, really not even half because you've got the ones underneath as well. And that just lessens the blow. So I always think um, if something's really in the wrong place, you really like it, just have a go and that will work really well. So. Um, don't, don't be timid, but do it earlier rather than later. And that beautiful little quince tree, that Cydonia oblonga, Serbian gold. Serbian gold is most important because Serbian gold gets much less quince, less quince leaf blight than the other quinces. I moved that a couple of years ago and you can see it's a lovely natural shape. It's very healthy. I don't bother to water it now, even though we've had a really dry summer. So go ahead, start moving. All keen gardeners love moving plants. We often get them in the wrong place initially, or sometimes they do much better or much worse than we thought. Um, and so we can't always get it right. And what's more, we like to refresh areas and change the planting around or reorganize it. So we spend a lot of time playing musical chairs with our plants in our gardens. And I think that's the whole fun of gardening. So now we've done moving plants, we're going to move on to another part of the garden where I'm going to show you how I take light resistant box cuttings. We've had a pre-submitted question on this, and this is from George. And George said he's fed up with box blight is there anything you can do? Now it's funny that George should say that because I planted out this garden with a thousand box plants about 33 years ago before I'd even heard of box blight and certainly way before it sort of became big. And I took a thousand cuttings from a garden in London, rooted them up, I took them about this time of year, rooted them up, uh, plant, uh, they rooted up by about spring planted out the liners and in a couple of years I had lovely thick box hedges and I loved them but it did mean I had to spray them to keep the blight at bay because our winters are getting wetter it seems it just got so wet and the blight just took hold and I could keep it in check by spraying with signum with top boxes and things like that but it's just a chore you just don't want to have to be doing that and then I found out about Didier Hermans.
Now Didier Hermans is a Belgian grower and he grows a lot of box and he started a new program to actually find a blight resistant box. So in 2007, he sowed 10,000 seedlings and bearing in mind that it takes a year to germinate a box plant from a seed, that's a lot of box seeds. And then um, after, after about a few years, I think it was something like 2015, he'd narrowed those 10,000 plants down to 150 plants, which he thought were promising against box blight, having that resistance. And he did this by completely hammering them and spraying them with box blight spores. And so he could see those that really tolerated the blight and those that succumbed. And then come 2020, so you can see it's a long lead in time from the start in 2007, he narrowed it down to the Fab Four. And I ripped out all my old box hedges, um, it was about last March, and I planted up with Didier Hermans with one of his, and I planted out Heritage. And these new plants that you can see all around me now have grown since last March and they're forming a nice little hedge. I haven't clipped them yet, but I will. But the other ones that Didier did, he did of the four, he's got this one, which is Skylight. Now this is meant to be a more erect plant. So it's perfect for topiary. You can see here, the leaves look slightly sparser perhaps than a traditional box, but it is definitely box. Um, it's a very good plant apparently if you want to because it does grow pretty fast. Then there's this one which is Renaissance and this is the one that they recommend if you want low box hedges, either this or heritage. You just have to clip it once a year. It's what they call broidery in Holland when you have sort of pattern work of box. Um, and, and the Renaissance is one that's meant to be very good for that. Um, and then finally, there's this one, this other box blight resistant one, which is called Babylon. Is it Babylon, Babylon Beauty? And you can see this has got a, a different habit, hasn't it? It's slightly prostrate. So this is a very good ground cover plant if you want a mass of, of low ground cover. And I imagine it forms just a completely flat mass when it's had time to get going. Now, they're excellent plants, I think, um, and I think they really are going to revolutionise box because a lot of people are going off using box totally because of this and because of the block box moth. We haven't yet got the box moth. I'm sure we will get it, but there are things that you can spray out. There, there are actually biological controls that you can use to control box moth. So I'm not particularly worried when that comes here, I'm just gonna use a biological control and that will be fine. And you spray, I think once or twice a year. Anyway, so I'm now going to remove a lot more of the other box in my garden and I'm going to replace it. And so in order to do that, I'm going to take box cuttings. Now, obviously, um, it, because this is a patented plant, it um, has got plant breeders right. So when you spend that time, that money, that investment on breeding a new plant, you obviously don't let people just take cuttings and sell it. So when any plant has plant breeders rights on it, you can propagate it for your own use, but you can't propagate it up to sell. So I'm going to actually propagate some of all of these and just try them out because I'd like to try big areas of them just to see how they look. But for today, I'm going to take Renaissance. Now, before I start actually taking the cuttings, I'm going to show you what medium I use. So I usually, do my cuttings in these trays. So these are just my polystyrene trays. They have no base, which I really like because when, when you turn them upside down, you can see if the roots are coming through or not. So you very quickly have an idea how well they're rooting. But when I actually fill it with compost, I just put this polystyrene board underneath so the compost doesn't drop out. Um, now, if you can't get those, which you probably can't because they're no longer made, um, and I inherited them from my mum, Charles Dowding has made these cell trays for sowing vegetables in. But because, again, they've got nice big bottoms, holy bottoms, which I really like, so they drain freely and they seem to aid rooting. And he's done them in all sorts of sizes, bigger than this and smaller than this. So I'd recommend that you got some of those online. And also, they look, look like to me, they would last for 30, 40, 50 years. I think they'd do you a lifetime. 
unlike the polystyrene, which has probably done about 20 years, but it is a bit worse for wear. Now, when I take cuttings, a box, you take the semi-hardwood cuttings. These are sort of just, you can just see the wood is just starting to lignify, just starting to get a little bit brown. Um, so with cuttings, you have the softwood cuttings that you usually take earlier on the summer, which is all a very soft greeny growth. And then at this time of year, and you can take these from September to November, really. Um, and if you take the cuttings now, they should be rooted by spring, if not sooner. Um, and so you, you take these cuttings, but uh, before I do that, I'm just going to fill the tray. Now you can use perlite or you can use vermiculite. Vermiculite is more, slightly more yellowy colour. This is perlite. Um, they both are very good products. You tend to use a bit vermiculite more, perhaps if you've got plants that like a wetter substrate because they, it holds the water a bit differently. I want a mix of half of the perlite, half of the multi-purpose compost. All it is doing is helping open the compost so it, it just makes it more free draining um, which is what you want. And then I'm just going to mix it up and I always like to wet my compost before I sow seeds, take cuttings or anything because compost is quite difficult to wet. When it comes out of the bag it's often really dry and then I'm going to put it on my old favourite and I usually do this and I'll um, do you know a fair few trays at a time so i'll have a barrow completely full of compost and loads of trays at the ready so i push it in roughly like that and then i just push them down and it does go in you want it quite firm in those trays so it it, it stays in well that one's broken so it won't do it and you quickly firm them through top them up where necessary and then you come to the exciting part, which is actually taking the cutting material. Now, as I said before, you really want to make sure the plant that you are taking the cutting from is in good health and growing well. If it's a sad, sickly old thing, it just probably won't do. So then I'll lift them both up. Those look nice, pop them there. And then I'm going to take cuttings of the Renaissance. Now, when you're doing cuttings, you'll, for a box, you'll take cuttings that are about three to six inches long. OK, now, obviously, if you've got loads of plants and you're not short of material, you'll probably go for six inch one. It doesn't make much difference. You just get a bit of a head start. If you haven't got much material, then you'll use everything you've got. Now, this one, I'm just pulling it away. And I don't know if you can see that, but that's with a heel, slight heel, because I just pulled it off from the main stem. Now, with some plants, it's important that you take them with a heel, and with some plants, it doesn't matter. And box is one of those that it doesn't matter. And then I just pull off a few leaves. Now, with, with, when you're taking any cutting, you usually do that because they lose the moisture through the leaves. So when you've got big floppy leaves, I'll maybe cut the leaves in half and remove, remove quite a few um, because you don't want them to dry it before they root. And then having got that little cutting, I'll just stick it in there and just sort of nicely firm it in. So I'm not using any hormone rooting powder. Hormone rooting powder is used for things that are a bit more tricky. It also has a fungicide in there so it stops them rotting. I never hardly ever ever use it because it has a very short shelf life um, and it's expensive and I find most things root without it. Um, so then I'll go on and I'm going to take just a few more. So I'm going to pull this one off again um, and I've got a nice wee tiny one there with a heel from a side shoot. Now if the sun was streaming down today and I was taking a slightly softer wood cutting than box I wouldn't be doing it in the sunlight because obviously that's going to dry them out. But it's a pretty autumnal day today. Um, now out of this one, I've got a longer one and I'm going to split it in two. So I'll get two bits. I could, if I was mean, get it out of three. So just cut it in half. Make sure you put them in the right way up. Well, that would be a bad mistake if you put it in upside down. Um, pull them off and then in they go. Well, that one's a bit of a duff one. So put it in there. Lovely. Um, and when I've done the whole tray, I'll just do a few more. Um, I'll just probably, oh, there's a nice little side shoot again. 
Now you could, you see that's got a better heel on it, it's got a little thing from where it's come off the plant and that, I don't know why but for some reason I always prefer plants with heels but it's totally rational, I don't think it makes any difference as to how they root. Um, that's got a nice little heel too and for me it doesn't matter if they're not uniform size cutting so some are bigger and some are smaller but if you go to a commercial nursery my mum had a commercial nursery and she had a big misting polytunnel and when you saw her thousands of cuttings all laid out they'd all be very similar the size of the cuttings and everything because they are into producing uniform batches of plants that's what she would sell on to the garden centers and like and but with me I don't mind if I got some diddly ones and some bigger ones it really doesn't matter I'll prune them all and sort them out anyway later on in the day and in her misting house she'll have mist <laughs> jetting over the plants at regular intervals. The tunnel was shut at either end usually, so it built quite a fug up in there. And sometimes you'd have heated mats on part of it, because with some things that are a wee bit tricky to root, if you've got bottom heat um, from below and you've got the mist coming on above and you haven't got bright sunlight, then they do root much better. Now I also cheat, if I'm doing something diff difficult I will put my cutting trays on a little heated mat in the greenhouse and that works well. I don't have the wonderful misting machine that she does have or did have but I do have my little misting bottle. Now this is actually an old fertilizer bottle <laughs> but I've washed it out, used it and now I've got water in it and when I've done the whole tray I'll just mist them over. Now if again it was something a bit sensitive, that was softer, softer leaves, that was more subject to wilt, when I put it in situ, um, in my, I'm going to put these in my Greek cold greenhouse, I might then be tempted just to put a little bit of milky polythene, if it was a bright sun today, over the top, so I'm lessening the shock. And if it was a really sensitive one, I might actually use a totally milky bag and actually enclose it within the bag and so you wouldn't have any air causing evaporation running over the top. Now with box cuttings you don't even need to put them in a greenhouse. I could do these and line them out in my vegetable garden and grow them like that and they would still root pretty well. I could put them in a coal frame or whatever. So you know they really are an easy subject to do. Um, now I, when, these are, when these are rooted I'll just you know come sort of February, March, April I'm just going to pick up the tray I'll probably see that they're bursting into life and I'll see little bits of green shoots but if I just pick up the thing I'll see underneath the tray little white roots pointing out and then you know it's time to pot them on. So then you just take out this little rooted plug it will come out with the compost all together around it because the roots are holding it in and then I'll either get a bigger pot probably something like a nine centimetre pot this looks like a three litre to me so it'll be a little pot and I'll either pot the rooted plug into the into the pot or much easier I'll just line them out in my hoarding borders where I grow on all my baby plants before moving into the big wide world the garden proper um, I probably wouldn't plant them out in the exact hedging position when they were just rooted liners because they are a wee bit vulnerable and they need a bit more space and light I don't want them competing with all the neighboring thugs that would be around them if I put them straight in position um, so that's really box plants rooting, but um, we did have another pre-submitted question and this was from Selena. Hello Selena. And she says, I've never taken cuttings before. What are the easiest ones to start with? Well, I, I mean, once you get in to taking cuttings, you watch it Selena, because it is extremely addictive. You just see how easy it is to get many plants um, and instead of just having one, you know, you go to a garden centre and you think, my God, that's eight pounds for that plant. You can root 20 cuttings of it and you, in, you know, in no time at all, you've got maybe 15 or maybe more really nice little plants. So it is addictive and what's more, you can see a lovely plant in a friend's garden. Instead of having to trot off and find who sells it, you can ask them nicely and if they give you a cutting, you can go and take the exact same plant. Um, so. 
it is addictive. But I, if I were you, I would start with willows. Now, um, they have preformed root initials. So that means that when you just break off a bit of willow, and you could take a, a stick of willow this big, and you could do it in autumn, winter, or you could do it later, and you just stick it in the ground, you'll find that next spring it will be growing away. I was um, working on a garden near the seaside, uh, where was it, somewhere in East Anglia, and there was a skip full of beautiful willow, and they had done this amazing green-stemmed woven willow hedge in the next door garden to the one that I was working from, and they'd shoved all their willing excess willow into the skip and it had been there for a couple of weeks so it looked really desiccated and dried out so well, I'll try it because it's just such a nice green willow so I took a load in the car shoved it in my hoarding border in the veg garden and it's rooting really nicely you know I probably watered it twice in this dry summer and it still managed so that is the easiest one in the world to do but also softwood cuttings are a, a, a very very easy or so, uh, very very quick and easy i mean i've got some in the greenhouse now i've got some verbena which you can take really any time from when the new growth starts right up till now and later if you had some lovely pelagoniums now um, that you wanted to save over winter and you wanted to increase you could just take some cuttings now and pop them in and then they could stay in their rooted trays as sort of little because they'll root pretty fast over winter and they always seem much hardier when they're just little rooted cuttings in a cold greenhouse whereas if you actually have a pelagonium um, a big pelagonium at colder temperatures it doesn't seem to withstand them so well as little cuttings seem to withstand them um, and the softwood cuttings are fleshier, softer, so you have to make sure you don't leave them out in the sunlight like I'm leaving these box now. You just whip them in, maybe put them under the milky bag or a clear bag in a greenhouse or a cold frame. Um, and I never, again, with those, bother with that. And then, Selena, when you get keen, you might invest in a hydropod, which is what I've just done now. I bought this lovely machine. Um, and basically it sprays you, it has a, a water basin in the bottom and then there's a tray that sits on top of the water basin and it's got little sponge discs in the tray with a slit in the sponge discs and you take your cutting and you shove it in the sponge disc and then you turn it on and it heats the water if you, if you get the heated version and it mists those stems the stems are just sitting in air, but the mist is spraying over them and it mists them. And I was amazed because last week, just seven days ago, I put in a load of different cuttings. I put in a really nice hydrangea that I love. I put in um, a selenum. I put in verbena. I put in some box. And already after seven days, quite a few of them have got nice little roots. The box hasn't yet got little roots, but this would I would expect this to be slower, but I'll keep watching it. And I, again, I've cheated it a bit because although you're meant to put one cutting per sponge disc, I try putting a bundle of cuttings in some of them, three or four or five, so I can get more plants in there. I mean, some things like mulberry, they always say is best rooted in bundles. So it's not mad to try that. And I can't see any reason why it won't work. Obviously they might all get knitted up as they root through with each other. So when I pull them apart, I'll do it quite carefully so I don't break up all the roots. Um, but it's great. I mean, if, you, if you're a cutting enthusiast, uh, you, you can't beat something like that because it just means it makes it much easier. So even more difficult subjects, I mean, something like Daphne is quite difficult to root. Um, so that I think will be a cinch with this. The problem is that I'll be giving people plants that they never knew they wanted for the next God knows how long as their presence will <laughs> be inundated with my treasures and they'll probably think, oh my God, not another plant from Bunny. But still, it is a great present to take when you go out to supper. It's better than the odd bottle of wine, I think. Anyway, so there we are. There are the box cuttings. Um, I hope you don't discard box because of box blight. There is a good way around it and we can sort out the box moth and I just think it's such a wonderful plant. I think it would be a big shame if people didn't carry on growing it. Anyway, now we're off to look at my truggery where I go my vegetables and my cut flowers. See you there. Well, this is my truggery. It's where I mix up my vegetables, my herbs and my flowers for cutting. 
And why do I do it like this? Well, there's several really good reasons, I think. First of all, the vegetable garden used to be banished to the bottom of the garden or in the big houses they had the walled garden way, way, way from the house. And it was almost quicker to go to the supermarket than to actually go down and pick some vegetables. So now we all like to have our vegetable garden right on the kitchen doorstep, which is exactly where mine is. So you can just pop out and lift some carrots for supper or cut some lettuce, whatever you like, really quick and easy. And so therefore, I think it has to look better. It has to look slightly more ornamental than just an ordinary vegetable garden. Now, I do find vegetables very attractive anyway, but I just really like this form of garden. It's almost like the old annual bedding garden schemes in that you can play with it. You can use all different annuals to mix in with your vegetables. You can try out different variations, different combinations. And it's a really exciting way to garden. It gives you scope for really practicing and trying out new things. Then there's the other reasons for mixing up vegetables with flowers. Um, so people are always talking about camp companion planting and how it works or how it doesn't. But one thing we know for sure is that companion planting means that you've got lots of flowers with nectar, with scent that actually diffuse and deflect the insects. So if you have a whole block of cabbages, then Sure enough, the cabbage white butterfly finds it no problem at all. But if you're able to break it up with lines of flowers, or maybe not have just blocks of cabbage, but intersperse different vegetable with it, then it really does help confuse the pests. We all know that French marigolds are really good for attracting hoverflies and parasitic wasps, but they also emit limonene, which actually deters the growth of adult whitefly. So quite useful to grow among your tomatoes. And then there are other flowers like hyssop and the pot marigold. So the hyssop's the little blue flower over there and the pot marigold. And they pull in things like hoverflies as well as bees and things like that. And they will actually then eat the aphids and things like that. So they're actually good at deterring insects as well. So it's a nice mix up. It's a big pot where you can stir in all different things that are quite beneficial. So we've said they're attractive. We said that it's quite useful for deflecting insect pests. It's increasing the diversity of the garden and we all like more diversity for insects which you know are declining in numbers. Now there's been very little research until quite recently on companion planting and that's because no firm benefits from it. Um, you're not going to get a chemical company at investing in that. So up to quite recently there's really been very little but I think we all agree that to mix them up is beneficial in many ways. Now I did have a pre-submitted question. It was from Pat and she said what cut flowers can I add to my vegetable garden that I can eat? And there are quite a few here. Now I've got lots of Amaranthus cordatus viridis, and that is a brilliant plant, the amaranth. And I've got loads this year because I'm going some for the Chelsea stand for Horatio's garden where I'm doing the design of the flowers in that. And so I put all the spares here and I had loads of spares because it's a very easy plant to grow. But I discovered that not only does it look brilliant, but you can eat the young leaves like spinach. And then when the seeds ripen, you can, you can cut the plant down, put them in a box lined with newspaper, put them in a warm, dry place, and then you can actually shake out the grain. And that you can use for a nutty like porridge. You can also use it as a gluten-free thickener, so that's good. And, um, and it's also, you can use it like a risotto, so that's one. I've got the lovely cut flower roses over there, um, the, the flower garden range from Wharton's. And you can use rose petals for jellies, for, for garnishing things. Uh, a lovely Japanese client of mine grows masses of them and she sent me some beautiful rose petal jelly and it was just really, really delicious. And things like lavender flowers are quite good. They attract cabbage white butterflies quite a lot, but you can obviously use the, the petals to make lovely lavender flower biscuits and things like that. So there are quite a few flowers um, that you can use, as well as marigolds, of course. You can use the, the petals um, in salads and garnishes. So really, you're increasing your food palette. 
you're increasing the, the aesthetic value of your garden, you're increasing its use for insects and birds. So I think mixing them up is just a, such an exciting way to garden. You can try different things every year. And I really am glad I'm doing it like this now. It's really working well for me. So that is the end of my gardening hack series for The Telegraph. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've picked up some tips. I hope that you get on with your garden and you're really enjoying it like I am. <laughs>